Star Talk, uh, an explainer. The explainer. We do this sometimes. Chuck. Hey, hey. I need you there when we get when we do explainers. But this one, yeah. I know a little bit about. We're going to talk about the James Webb Space Telescope. Wow. I know a little bit about it, but okay. not enough to fill a whole explainer on it. Mm -hmm. So we reached in to NASA headquarters, and we found we found the chief scientist. And there he was, and he's on Star Talk right here, right now. Jim Green, Jim, it's a delight to have you. We go way back. Thanks for being on Star Talk. Neil, my great pleasure. And Chuck, good to see you again. Definitely good to see you, Jim. Jim Green, you 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 come to us as a planetary scientist from way back. And you're, you're chief scientist at NASA, and you're retiring next year. Where will I we am. go? What will we do? What, what are we gonna do? <laughs> oh my god. And wait, wait, you're retiring right when the James Webb Space Telescope deploys. This mm -hmm. is a little suspicious, if you ask me. <laughs> not, not really, but after 42 <laughs> years, you know, it's, uh, it's time, uh, you know, to uh, step into retirement. But, you know, I'd like to uh, continue to work with NASA. I have several papers I need to finish. Nice. Uh, I want to work with uh, NASA on gravity assist and, uh, you know, uh, do these things that I like to do. So you've got a gravity assist podcast. As a, that's the best title ever for a podcast. I just want to put, put in my vote for that. And Thank you, you. you just published a book, a 50-year review of planetary exploration at NASA. And, wow. it, and it just came out. Just congratulations on all of the above. The podcast, the book, the retirement, the career. And now we got to pick your brain about James Webb Space Telescope. Yeah, and I got 100 questions, about. and okay. I just want to hear it from the horse's mouth. Sorry right. to call you a horse in this, but. <laughs> uh, a, a mouth I do have. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone is thinking of this as like the replacement for Hubble. So could you just uh, amend that thought yeah. for us all? Yeah. You know, uh, when we go into space, we have the wonderful opportunity to look in different wavelengths, wavelengths of light that don't make it to the surface of the Earth. Now, Hubble actually looked at the visible, Many of those wavelengths, or all those wavelengths make it to the surface of the Earth, uh, but not into the infrared. And that's why we needed a new telescope. And that's what the James Webb Space Telescope does. It, it, it really hones in on a brand new wavelength regi regime that we haven't done much with. Wow. So uh, what intrigues me is when I first learned of the James Webb and how it's tuned for the infrared, the eye being fundamentally a... Uh, a large-scale structure guy of the universe, I was very excited to recognize that it will be able to see the formation of galaxies in the early universe in a right. band of light that is redshifted into its, into its zone. I mean, into, right. it's, it's like the universe is as... <laughs> it's like, time universe, put, it, put it here, universe, and then we yeah. got you, right? Wow. right? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a time machine. Yeah, so basically, it, it, yeah, you know, yeah. The further it looks, uh, the, the further those objects are away, the further back in time we see them. And their light was started out as ultraviolet or maybe even some x-rays. And by the yeah. time it reaches us through the expanding universe, it's landing in our lap as infrared. And you got the damn telescope to find that. Yeah, but then to learn that it's not only finding the farthest reaches of the universe, uh, infrared can actually peer into gas clouds. So tell us about that. Ah, well, that's an, a really important uh, aspect of it because it allows us to look at the birth of stars and their associated planets. Ah. And, and that really is uh, exciting to see. And these are just right in front of our noses, right? So yeah. and that's what intrigues me. It's the farthest reaches of the universe and things that are happening right in our backyard, our, our cosmic backyard, right? W within Indeed. our own galaxy. What do you decide to point it first? Oh, good question. Oh, well, you know, uh, uh, scientists uh, uh, propose. Right, there's a cage match. There's the octagon. <laughs> and we go. <laughs> with, with the chainsaws. You know, don't forget the chainsaws. you you got to have that. Chairs Jim, you got to put that in. Before, that's got to be your retirement legacy. You know, the, the first light on a telescope is whoever wins the cage match among the astronomers. you got to do that. Yeah, right. Indeed. 
Well, uh, you know, must, m- much of that early part of the program has been worked out. Uh, but we also have some time, about 100 hours that have been set aside uh, to look at the solar system. Now, this is really an exciting thing because I was at NASA headquarters as head of planetary science uh, from 2006 on. And in about 2007, we went through a review on what JWST could do. And in that review, I said at the end of it, well, aren't we going to use it to look at objects in the solar system? Because our sun heats them up and they glow in the infrared. And we can look at aurora, infrared aurora on planets. And all kinds of things were coming to my mind. And I was told, no, this is an astronomy telescope and we can't track things. And so um, Alan Stern, the AA at the head uh, at the time, turned He's to me Mr. and said, Pluto. He's Mr. He's Pluto. Mr. Pluto. It's yeah, Alan yeah, Pluto yeah. Stern. That's his middle name. Wow. Yes. We've confirmed yes. that. You're, yes. you're, you're mortal enemy. No, stop. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't get anything started. Don't derail this conversation, Chuck. <laughs> so, so Alan turned to me and said, um, well, what, what do you think we ought to do about it? I said, let's, let, let's take a second and see if, if, uh, uh, what needs to happen for JWST to track objects in the solar system. And so it was early enough in the development, uh, the project went away and they came back a couple months later and said, we got great news. It's just a software uh, set of mods that we can make and we can track things from Mars on out. Wow. Wow. So uh, so there's an important point you're making there because when we see the distant universe, nothing is moving at any rate that matters to, you just sit on that spot in the sky, but everything in the solar system is moving. Yeah. And of course, uh, we need time to collect those photons, even though we have a huge collecting area, we want to see out into the Kuiper belt, you know, and they'll emit in, uh, infrared, but they're so far away from the sun that it will still be dim. The and Kuiper so belt, need, of which Pluto is a prominent member. Uh, mm. the, yes, yes, one of the archetype members of the- <laughs> okay. uh, Or you mean the, escapee. Oh, I don't know. It's <laughs> oh dear, oh, what have I done? <laughs> well, you know, uh, some of them haven't escaped. You got Triton, which is probably a, 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 a Kuiper Belt object, you know, in orbit around Neptune. So, mm, so wow. what what happened is the project said it just costs money. Now's the perfect time to do it. Add the money, and we can complete the software and track uh, track objects. And Alan turned to me and said, "Green, you got the money." And I said, "I'm going to do whatever I can to get you the money." And indeed, that's Planetary's investment in this spectacular telescope is is getting the software that enables the telescope to track objects from Mars on out in the solar system. That's that's a beautiful thing. And and, uh, remind us where this thing is getting planted. It's not just in Earth orbit like Hubble. That's right. It's in a very special place. And uh, this particular place is behind the Earth in, in what we would call the Earth's magneto tail, okay? Whoa. And it's called uh, L2. It's a That's a new point. anatomical part, you know? Yeah. The mag- <laughs> yes. That's the right. magneto tail. <laughs> the magneto tail. It, it sounds like a new X-Man. No, <laughs> magneto tail. <laughs> So, so that's, that's how you remember to pronounce magnetosphere correctly, is think of magneto and then put a sphere on the end of it. Good. There you go. <laughs> nice. All right, so this but, is on the other side of the moon, right? No, it's directly behind the Earth in line from the Earth to the sun. Oh. Interesting. L2 oh. is behind us. And, and it's a unique place because what's happening is uh, in that location, it's really orbiting the sun. But because it's behind the Earth, it would move slower around the sun than the Earth does. But here's where the Earth comes in. The gravity from from the Earth pulls it along. And so not only the sun's gravity, but the Earth's gravity keeps it in a nice position we call L2, which is like 920 million miles away from the Earth. So this has nothing to do with the moon. Moon keeps doing its orbit around the Earth right, like it, like right. nothing's happening while this spacecraft is still out there. So if you're in L2, uh, can we get there to service it in case we need to? I know that's a big topic. A lot of people ask that, and the answer is it never was planned to be serviced. So? Uh-huh. 
So, so we're not going to be able to do that at this stage. At this stage. Okay. So in principle, though, L2, if it's going to be a happening place to plunk future space telescopes and, and whatever else might live there, because Lagrangian points, those are, those are fun points to hang out in. Um, I can imagine, I'm, I'm making this up, just spitballing here, NASA has a, has a, has a, <laughs> has a handyman mission. <laughs> it's, it's the handyman uh, 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 vehicle that goes out there and you, and you collect all the, the spacecraft that need, um, all the space telescopes that need repair, and then it comes back. Uh, how about that? Well, uh, that's a good thought, uh, but uh, that's not NASA's thought. We, our prime mission is indeed uh, for a nominal five-year mission, but it has fuel to station keep, meaning stay in L2, you know, uh, for about 10 years. Wow. Yeah, I, I'm thinking of a handyman mission. Okay, yeah. I'll work on that, Jim. We'll call it NASA's AAA. <laughs> Tri AAA comes in. Oh, you, need, you got a flat. You need, yeah. you need a jump. <laughs> well, you may need fuel. That's probably I, what you'll need. I, I, can't, I can't believe I locked myself out of my satellite. <laughs> ah. Wait, wait. So, Jim, Jim, I got one last question because we're running short on time. Um, is there a mode the telescope can go in that is, because uh, what I always loved even telling the public about that we do as scientists is, of course, you design an instrument for what you intend to find, all right? That's how you know what the parameters are and what the specs should be. But is there a mode where it's just looking for nothing, like a serendipity mode? Mm. So in case something shows up that nobody ordered, nobody was looking for, and we end up scratching our head when it shows up. Like every other telescope in New York City. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, uh, like Hubble, you know, which decided, okay, we've got some spare time. Let's just stare in an area and then found the, you know, fabulous array of galaxies that it did. There'll probably be some time when we will, you know, look in a particular area and then just turn it on and see what we find. But at the moment, it's really well subscribed, as we would say. You know, we have 100 hours uh, uh, open to the planetary scientists to make a variety of measurements of solar system objects. That data will come in and be available to all the other planetary scientists. And, and then many of the astronomers uh, will have already accepted proposals and they'll be, uh, you know, following, following that uh, schedule that they've created. But that won't really kick in until six months after launch. Okay. And but the point with that famous photo, the Hubble Deep Field, we just stared at nothing for a long time. It became one of the most famous images it ever took. That was the director of the Hubble Space Telescope Institute saying, "Do this, and I don't care what anyone says because I'm the director, and I have director's discretion every time." <laughs> Is there someone in JBWST? Because it's not going to be you because you're retiring. Is there somebody who's going to say, "Let's just do this. Don't judge me until after." Is there someone who has that power? Perhaps. Um, you know, J J <laughs> Another, J cage <laughs> Another cage match. Another cage match. But Hubble was up for many, many years before that. All right, and, Good point. and therefore, therefore they they felt they they had an opportunity to then reach outside the normal set of things that they'd be doing to discover something new and important. Perhaps a man did they ever. Very good and, and so that's why I say initially it's really well subscribed. We've got so many things we know we need to uh, make those observations to make those discoveries. And so that's first on the list. All right, Jim, wow. it's been great to have you on here. We've got to end it there. But uh, we look forward to the launch. We look forward to the successful deployment. Uh, <clears throat> that's going to be a nail biter, uh, deploying something that's never existed before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Who knows? If somebody forgot to, you know, unlatch something before it was loaded, right? You know, that's then someone needs some explaining to do on that. Uh, but anyhow, we look forward to this, and congratulations on a on a, a marvelous career. Uh, I've known you ever since I've known NASA, so the, I feel like uh, you and NASA have become one. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. That was very kind of you to say. <laughs> and your Gravity Sys podcast, check it out. And of course, uh, 50 Years of Planetary Exploration, just uh, published by NASA. And so you can uh, 
check that out as well if you want to sort of eavesdrop on, on what was going on. So, uh, Chuck, always good to have you, man. Always a pleasure. Excellent. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, as always. Keep looking up. <laughs>